Sean. It's me. <laughs> relax, relax. It's me. I'm just wearing a mask. You're, you're not like at the hospital. Uh, how are you? You doing good? Feeling okay? Hey, listen, you fell asleep in front of the TV again. Why don't you go on back to bed? All right. You know you're not supposed to be up this late. Okay. Can we up that woman's dose? A uh, <laughs> uh, little hand update. I have a new cast on. It's a hard cast. Who's there? Who's there? Uh, a pained friend of mine who was very involved in my self-romantic life. Oh. Stuck in a cast. Um, so I've been having to like live with this thing. We're going to see it for the next few episodes, unfortunately. The worst thing about this is that I can't get it wet. And so I have to like put it in a trash bag and tape <laughs> it up. And whenever I want to take a shower, which if you know me, is like often. So like to take a shower, to like wrap it up, I have to like sit like this. It's like it, what it must have been to like take a shower at Hitler Youth Camp. <laughs> Hitler Youth Camp. Was there a Hitler Youth Camp? I think there maybe was. <laughs> the darkness. Um, well, we have a little note from the producer from, uh, from last episode. A little correction, I guess, we should make. This is, uh, says, uh, correction from previous episode. Uh, that billionaire guillotine joke, remember that? We love that joke. <laughs> Turned out to be very similar to a joke which had already been circulating on social media. <laughs> oh, oh We didn't realize we had been beaten to that joke and that uh, the French Revolution was on so many people's minds. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, of course, Boulder County Tonight would never support any kind of violence and the joke was, of course, never intended to be a call for violent action to be taken against anyone. Uh, Boulder County Tonight apologizes to whoever got there first. <laughs> the tangled vastness of the internet. <laughs> uh, fuck! 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 Why can't you do it? Why can't you do it? Why can't you tell the jokes? Why can't you do it? Fuck! 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 <laughs> Well, it was Labor Day this week, uh, yesterday. Uh, happy Labor Day to you. I uh, hope you had a great holiday. Uh, what is Labor Day, you ask? What, is that? What, what was Labor Day? What was Labor Day? Great question. <laughs> Something we made up in uh, 1884. And listen to this. This is going to be a quote. When I do like this, just know that these fingers wish they could do this. <laughs> this is about to be a quote. I don't want to frighten you. It's not like a follower of Baphomet or whatever it is. <laughs> be like this. Um, Labor Day was a national holiday to celebrate the labor movement and the works and contributions of laborers to the development and growth of America. <laughs> Didn't know that, did you? Because when I think Labor Day, I think two phrases. I think Happy Labor Day, which is sort of a fucked up phrase that doesn't make any sense. And then of course I think uh, Labor Day sale. <laughs> so what that means, Labor Day sale is code for the people we're celebrating, the laborers, they're going to have to work on Labor Day. <laughs> That's what the fuck that means. These people, you know, like 40% of companies have it, some of their employees stay for Labor Day, right? Remember, like, during the apocalypse last year, <laughs> we called, like, our laborers, people like the grocery store, for instance, our friends at the grocery store. Um, we called them heroes, of course, because <laughs> they were facing a fucking pandemic because we were standing on each other's necks to get toilet paper. <laughs> we needed somebody to do it. They're fucking real <laughs> heroes from that story. But when they signed up to bag groceries, they weren't signing up to be Batman. They weren't supposed to be like national level heroes. You know what I mean? 
It's those, those people that we will, you know, our society fights tooth and nail to not raise their pay one dollar. Those people, the heroes, the laborers. They worked on Labor Day, motherfuckers. Just a note. Just a note. Another note? We have another note from uh, the producer. Hold on one second. Let me see what this is. Okay, uh, this says, corporate statism, or simply corporatism, is a political culture closely related to fascism, where corporations team up with the government to abuse workers in the name of profit. Why did they give me that? I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what that means. That wasn't exactly a production level note. Thank you for snapping to my poetry. <laughs> let's, let's be a little more conscientious with our producer notes. Uh, what else is going on over there? Uh, a little national news again. Oh, remember, you guys remember the war on terror? Yeah. The one that we like uh, declared uh, mission accomplished on like 18 <laughs> years ago? Well, it turns out that was still going. So the war of terror, the war on terror rather, is over. <laughs> and uh, we lost. <laughs> uh, yeah, we lost the war on terror. And I think it's now time for Americans to realize and maybe admit to ourselves, the modern way that we go to war makes the shit we go to war against stronger. Wow. Here's how you know. Went to war against terror 20 years ago. What's happened in the last 20 years? Oh, way less terror, obviously. No, more terror. We get more shit. It's more happening like where we live and shit now at a different level. And like uh, the war on drugs, right? Did we defeat drugs in the United States? Did they defeat drugs or are there like way more drugs? More drugs. More drugs. I'm against that particular war, of course. I'm against all the wars. So like, what's another one? But, um, the war on Christmas. Oh. oh, every year I hear about like, oh my God, there's a war on Christmas. They're trying to throw baby Jesus in the river or whatever. <laughs> and like, I don't know, how's Christmas doing? <laughs> Christmas is doing pretty good, if you notice. As capitalists, of course, it's our most holy holiday <laughs> because it's our big sale day. <laughs> And it's got a war against it constantly. Since I was a child, since the 90s, we've been fighting the war against Christmas. And Christmas just is unbeatable. Us atheists, we're just going to have to give up smashing the war Christmas. But I know, I know what you're thinking. Andy, we're so glad that the war on terror is over. Oh, God, me too. I'm so pleased. But of course, there are some like bad, sad things about ending the war terror. And I know that you're just as worried as I am about the well-being of our great American war profiteers. What are they going to do? Where are they going to go? How are they going to feed their families? Right? Oh, they've been the, in this reliable state, you know. Uh, the, the, it's been a thriving industry, of course, being at war in Afghanistan <laughs> for 20 years. And now these people are having the rug pulled out from under them, thrown out into the street. And here's the problem with these folks, of course. They've been doing the same thing for 20 years. They've been profiting off of our tax dollars to go kill people that aren't really trying to bother us. Just a note there, they've been fighting this war, right? So now that the war's over, what are they going to fucking do? They don't exactly have a lot of skill sets other than like defrauding the government with mass murder. <laughs> They don't exactly have a lot of skill set for the modern peaceful economy, do they? What are they gonna fucking do? Work for Uber? <laughs> they gonna drive for Uber? They've bombed more cars than they've driven. <laughs> what are they gonna do, like work at the pawn shop? And they're like, buy Sean's guitar for $50 and resell it to him for $120,000? <laughs> you know what I mean? They don't have a skill set for the modern world, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and even though we're worried about these people, I want you to know that the government <laughs> is worried too. And so we've actually already built in the answer for this particular problem. We left behind billions of dollars worth of Humvees and helicopters and equipment 
This way they have something to fight us with when we <laughs> declare war on them again in a few years. <laughs> See? So don't you worry about the war of profiteers. I just want to put you, put your little minds at ease about that shit. There's another, there's another quick note from the producers. Let me grab that for us. Surely some war statistic. Let's see. Oh, this is from our producer, Mr. Raw. It says, uh, I am strange. My mind is tinted with the colors of madness. <laughs> they fight in silent furor in the effort to possess each other. <laughs> I am strange. I have approached a degree of love that is so unwise in one world that it is wisdom in another. <laughs> I am strange. I no longer have respect for hate, for I am stronger than hate. I am contemptuous of both those who hate and those who destroy. I am not a part of the world which hates and the world which destroys. I want a better world. And not only do I want a better world, I seek to live a better life so that I have the right to be a part of a better world. I, if I hate and destroy, I have no right to speak of love. Love is greater than hate, and I have chosen love above all else in the world. No more notes. What are you doing? That was weird. Thank you very much. Let's, let's reassess our relationship with the producer. Uh, no more notes for the rest of the episode. Uh, that was a weird one. Uh, the episode! Oh my god, this episode's brought to you by our good friends. Do you need a drink, motherfucker? Because I do. Our sponsor, this company here, Abbott and Wallace Distilling. Oh my god, we love them. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. Evan Walls Distilling, my good friends, they are a whiskey and rum distillery. Uh, they make cocktails and mocktails. They got munchies. Um, they do live music very often. They do uh, public tastings and events. Um, you can buy their stuff in local stores. Uh, but I recommend stopping into the actual place. That's at 350 Terry Street, 720-545. 2017. That's their phone number. Remember when you used to call people, you just dial in the numbers and then you talk to them? That's what you could do with that little combination. Uh, on today's episode, we'll be having an interview, not with an inanimate object, with uh, someone's hand up its ass, but rather uh, one of our dear public servants, uh, a city council person who is uh, running for re-election, and um, we're going to invite her onto the show now. This is Marsha Martin. Marsha, please join me. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Please have a seat. If I can find a chair, I will. <laughs> well, hello. So now that we're seated and we have drinks, we can take our masks off. That's the rules. That's the rules. And as long as we um, put the mask back on before we stand up, then we're okay. That's what the Boulder County Health Department wanted us to do, so that we could, you know, buy drinks. <laughs> I'm a letter of the law guy, as you might suspect. Yeah. Um, Marcia, you have been on city council a while now, yeah, for, for a full term. I've been on city council for four years minus two months, because the election was in the very first, second day of November, for this fall. And... Um, what else is there to say about it? How do you like it? <laughs> <laughs> Have you noticed a theme with these answers? When you're like, how do you like being on city council? And you're like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in, in some ways it's the best job I've ever had, and in other ways it's the most thankless job I've ever had. Um, but I think it's a job that needs to be done. Uh, and so when I started, running in the first place, I swore up and down that I would not run for a second term because I didn't want to be beholden to anybody and I wanted to be able to always tell the truth. And so I did that, and then you know what happened? Nobody ran against me. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> <laughs> that helps a lot, and you're in my ward. Yeah, well, you know, I'd like the number of votes to not be embarrassingly low, so I'd appreciate your vote. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, uh, even if there weren't options, I would consider voting for you. You're such a delightful character. Oh, well, thank you. I am a character, I think. <laughs> um, but, uh, 
Yeah, it's, it, you know, local government, somebody only probably said this in one of your interviews, but local government is really where we really touch the people the most, and that we do the things that, that we need because we can see them. I had this adventure during the pandemic when it was impossible to go out and see people and talk to them, you know, but Longmont has some very, very large local Facebook groups. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> large, like bigger than my ward, okay? Uh-huh. And so I did my fix of, of working with the public by lurking on that uh, <laughs> Facebook group. And, you know, I found out that the public doesn't know how to access the services that government has there ready and waiting for them. And what kind of services would you need? Well, like getting a, a hit of money to uh, make sure that they are they they stay current on their rent mm. or their electric bill. That's a thing and that's available in the city. I didn't know. That. Yeah, it is, and it, you know, especially since the ARPA passed, there is a lot of money available in the city. But there always has been. They don't know how to get a housing voucher, or if they applied for one eight years ago and they haven't heard anything, they think it's still okay. You know, and I they say, you know, you should check in and see if they still have you because what probably happened is your number came up and they couldn't find you did you update your address every time you changed couches you know Mm -hmm. and uh you know and the answer is no well okay so here's the deal you know if if somebody takes you to court show up if it's an eviction hearing show up it's free you get a mediator from the city to come and stand there with you and make sure that your side is is represented and try to work out a deal because the worst thing you want to do is have to find another place to live right now yes. we don't have enough places to live and they cost way too much they cost oh they cost way too much <laughs> and uh so you know my number one mission on the city council is to find ways to rebalance the inventory you know just like walmart does um, we need to make sure that we've got the right kind of houses at the right price so that um, people can find places to live and so that uh, people um, don't bid the houses we've got out of, out of anybody's price range, which is what's happening right now. Right. You know, now, most people don't need to live on the historic west side. They may think they do, but nobody really needs to live there. <laughs> You know, everybody needs an apartment or a condo, and it shouldn't cost more than about a third of what they earn. Well, so if we bid up all of the houses up to where they cost as much as Boulder, or raise all the rents to where rent costs as much as Boulder, we're shooting ourselves in the foot as a city. That's right, I agree. Right? Yes. Because, you know, what we want to have is we want to have this ladder so that as people have different stages of their lives, they can move around and be in the kind of house that they need, you know, and by the time they have three kids, a dog, and two cats, well then, yeah, maybe they can afford a house with a yard and all of that stuff. But when they're just starting out, they don't need that, and you know what? Life is hard, and being an adult is hard. You probably don't want that. You may think you want that, (laughs) but remember about mowing the lawn. You know, you don't want to do that. I didn't want to do that when I was young. And you know what? Now I'm old and I don't want to do it either. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, it was a big deal learning how to help people that are in trouble when, you know, we're doing a really bad job at making the help possible find when it doesn't even occur to a lot of people that it's there. One of our main focuses on this show, well, three of them are affordable housing, Mm -hmm. homelessness, and how we're treating that population, Mm -hmm. and then workforce abuse. So we have all these jobs that pay bullshit, and we're expected to pay an incredible rent every month. We're Mm -hmm. trying to see how those things are related and what we can do about it. You know, they are all, all related, even in ways that are different than what um, people will obviously think. So, you know, average Joe whose house is already paid for um, and has been living in Longmont since there were 40,000 people here instead of 100,000 people here, you know, they naturally think that if we build a bunch more places for people to live, 
that they're all going to live their lifestyle and they're all going to have two cars and the traffic in Longmont is going to get way worse. Mm -hmm. But what really is true is that if we did that, you know, if we built dense housing in the inner part of the city, not on top of the historic west side or even the historic east side, you know, but around that, um, then all those people who work here and are commuting into the city could, could live here instead. And that's not going to, they're not going to come here with three cars and drive around all day to make up for not having to do the commute. <laughs> you know, right? They're not going to do that. <laughs> you know, instead they're going to get on their bike or they're going to walk. They're going to drive way, way less. And when they do, it's going to be at the time when most other people don't drive, right? Only like moms with young babies are going to be driving then when they drive. And, and so this is perfect. Having urban density and people who work here, able to live here, makes us have less traffic, which is what everybody wants. And yet, whenever there's a new building that being, a, you know, a permit that comes before the city council, everybody within like two miles of the new development comes and says, it's going to ruin my neighborhood, it's going to make more traffic, <laughs> it's going to, you know, Everything is different, and you promised me that this wasn't going to happen. <laughs> I feel like that's a silly thing to worry about. I feel like on um, the things that are happening in the city, I feel like traffic is like not that terrible of a thing that's happening. I'm more worried about like people that can't pay their rent because their job pay is bullshit during the pandemic, and then they get kicked out of their house. They become part of our homeless population. And, but but they all are related, and, and I agree and, that they're related. And that is the whole point, because if you have, you know, what happens now is, is if, because you don't have enough housing, then the luxury apartments are snapped up by people who, who would really like more than that. And if you built um, affordable market housing, then those people would live there because they'd rather enjoy the, the two hours a day that they're not commuting than, uh, you know, and have pocket money so that they could spend. And that would mean that they wouldn't be trying to get into the affordable housing because they can't find any other place. And that means we could keep people who need affordable housing in affordable housing. Because this is the other trick about homeless people. You know, there are some people who are going to be homeless and we have to figure out how to coexist with them. Yeah. But the other thing about people who become... I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with that particular point. But well, we can, we talking. can debate that, but I'd like to make the first point first, Please. which is, which is that if somebody falls out of housing, you know, because they were just barely there, they were just barely making rent and feeding their kids and getting to their job every day, you know, uh, if, if something happens like their kid needs to go to the emergency room and, you know, what, or their car breaks down, any of those things, and they get, they lose their lease because of that and become homeless, you know, well, first of all, they're going to lose their kids. And second, when they, they're going to be really sad when they're on the street, you know, and they're probably going to get sick. And after about six months of living that way, they become the other kind of homeless who just don't believe there's anything else. Because they're hopeless because they haven't treated in the system. Yeah, well, like that makes sense to lose hope. I would lose hope too if I were trying to make the system work. That's that's absolutely right. That's I'm, what I'm I, trying to say. It feels like the system at large is not incentivized to fix the homeless problem because I think systemically what works for our masters is we work our shitty jobs as hard as we can and we take whatever pays available, but like the threat is if you become homeless, there is no help for you. So you better just take this shitty job and shut the fuck up. I well, believe the new American dream is just stability. I'm really sorry that's true because in my entire life I have found stability really boring and uh, I, th I think we need change to stay alive, you know, to know we're alive. Of course. But there's change and then there's change, you know, falling out of your crummy apartment is not the kind of change that makes you feel alive. Right. Um, and, and yeah, uh, you know, I had a big public fight with some people on the staff about three years ago because I said, why don't we build a homeless shelter? You know, there's a homeless shelter in Boulder 
But if you're in that homeless shelter in Boulder and your crummy job that you have held on to by your fingernails is in Longmont, and then to be in the shelter in Boulder, you have to be in coordinated entry, and coordinated entry requires you to keep four appointments a day, a, a week, which also is gonna make you lose your crummy job because you get paid by the hour and if you're not there, they fire you and then they pay you pay the next person who wants a crummy job, you know. And gas is four dollars an hour or well, four dollars a gallon? People, they don't usually have a car and they may get a bus pass or they may not get a bus pass. They may have to panhandle for the bus pass. Right. You know, so it's it's I really thought earlier in my uh, in my term on council that the most important thing we needed to do was build a homeless shelter. But you know what, if you build a homeless shelter, that is like hundreds of single moms that can't be given between $500 and $12, $1,200 a year. <laughs> My mouth doesn't work because I'm getting old. Oh, but, no, I um, but, but anyway, that you can't give all those single moms the money that it takes to keep them from falling out of their apartment. So it's not just a, well, you know, the system doesn't care about those people and you can't just build them a homeless shelter. You know, what it is, is we have to choose between about 150 homeless people that are living on the streets in Longmont and um, a, a much larger number of single moms who aren't living on the street yet. So it's, it is a hard decision. And I will tell you the truth, I don't know where I stand on it right now. And what I, what I think I know is that coordinated entry has a lot of rules that are keeping people out of it. Yes, you know? they have to show that they've been in town for six months or more, yep. living on the streets for six months or more, yeah. and evading the police at the same time, of course, because in Boulder, if you are trying to live on the streets, the police will show up and take your blanket and kindly ask you to stop existing. Yes, I mean, the, 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 we have a new chief of police, so I don't want to be too certain about policies, although oh. I hear he's a really good guy. Uh, episode but two was largely about that issue. We were mostly talking about <laughs> what they're doing in, uh, in Boulder. In Boulder, yes. yeah, which is something that I don't have a lot of authority over. Of course, you know? of course. Um, in Longmont, we have the core team, which I think is sort of our answer to sending police to deal with nonviolent Yeah, well, we problems. have the core team. We have read and, you know, if you are addicted. We, I mean, we have a lot of stuff. And not only that, if you are camping in an out-of-the-way place or sleeping in an out-of-the-way place with your backpack as a pillow, you know, we don't move you along unless people really complain. Yeah. You know, because... Well, it'd be like starting a campfire in the alley. That's a problem or whatever. Well, and yeah, especially if it's up against the wall of a wooden building. But yeah. also, like, Boulder is underperforming with beds for these people and shelter to give them. Oh, sure. There's a church in town that is almost outperforming the city of Boulder. Well, it's actually two churches, two I believe. Two churches, I think you're right. But, but yeah. And, and That's a disgrace. Can, it's a disgrace it's to a our disgrace. system. It's a disgrace. It is a disgrace, although I do want to give a, a shout-out to, you know, Hope who is the organization that organizes the what, what? sleeping areas in the, in the churches. Um, you know, there are, uh, uh, there's Journey Church, and honestly, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I think it's changed recently, and so I don't know what the second church is right now. Yeah, I, I don't know um, what they are either. Uh, but but I'd also like to give a shout out to DJ K-Wub. k, -Wub. k -Wub. I just wanted to give a shout out to you. It just oh, seemed like, okay. like a good time in the show. Yeah, right. Um, and, and, you know, we have the Veterans Community Project. I, I think it's important to talk about them a little bit. What's that? The Veterans Community Project, which was, is, is being built on land that was donated by an evil developer. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, you could, you should have really clapped for that. Yeah, yeah, I can so it was donated to a group of veterans who understands what it is like to have been in the military in the United States without a draft, where they essentially use you up, and um, you know some people make it and and get tough and get life skills and all of that stuff, and those are the ones that are running the Veterans Community Project. Some people get used up, and. 
you know, have a really hard time reintegrating into society. That's right, they're victims of the system as well. Uh-huh, yeah, although I, I really have to say, victim of the system is one of the things that you talk about a lot before you have held office, Andy. Mm -hmm. And so once you get in and figure out how complicated it is, and then, and then you don't actually know the answer, it's something that you say a lot less. That's so, right. so think about that. You know. I'm not great at thinking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I do know that like a lot of my friends that did go into the military were basically tricked into joining um, that can with, with the promises and whatnot. And then they show up, they get weeks and weeks of training to become a soldier, but they get zero training on the way back out to become a normal person again, whose job it isn't to kill everyone. Yeah, yeah. That's a tough line to draw. And like our, the way that our system is set up at this point, we do sort of use up those people and just kind of like good luck turning back into a normal person or whatever and living back in normal society again. Yeah, well, so they're building a tiny home building village and tiny homes is one of those keywords that everybody who thinks about low cost housing says, oh, that's the solution. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's, it's not, the, not a good solution at all because first of all, they all have to have the same city hookups, you know, sewer, water, electricity and stuff as a whole house does or, or a, you know, a multi-family building does, but they're really little. So you need a lot, a lot of hookups and those are the most expensive part of the building. Um, but what they are really good for is if you have post-traumatic stress or a traumatic brain injury, you know, living on top of somebody else who also has some kind of a problem like that is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, you know, and, and Longmont had that because we have what's called permanent supporting housing, permanent supportive housing in the suites, right? And it, it's a former hotel. And uh, without a lot of case management in there, um, people start not getting along. And, and it's a problem because they're all living on top of each other. So tiny homes are a really great way to give people their own space while they make the transition from traumatized homelessness back to a, a, a more stable member of society. I appreciate your insight on that. It, it's obviously like a piece of what would help a part of that community, but it's obviously not the whole idea. Yeah, well, you know, and if they did that with um, with like the people that are coming out of Afghanistan now, you know, you wouldn't need two years, which is how long the Veterans Community Project um, hopes that people will stay before they're ready to, to move on to having their own place and their own job and all of that, right? Um, but the, um, if you could do that for three months instead of just getting turned loose, you know, where's your family? Well, you know, we have, um, we have a, a, a transition hostel, you know, 25, 30 miles from where, where your family is and where your friends are and where you went to college, whatever it is, you know. And so, um, you know, you'd live there for three months while you're getting your feet on the ground and look for jobs and figure out how the skills you lived in the military transfer uh, into the private sector. And, and maybe it wouldn't be so traumatic when that happens to people. And right now that's happening to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And right now the United States is still trying to decide whether we welcome the people that you know, saved the lives of our veterans in Afghanistan or whether we're gonna decide that they're immigrants and we don't like them. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I hope we make the right decision about that. Yeah. Um, all I can say is that you know, as a public servant who is gonna have a job uh, next year because they don't have an appointment. Um, you know, I'm gonna try to help coordinate, call me up, you know, or send me an email or something, but if you're an organization, a nonprofit that wants to find a way to host some people out of Afghanistan, call me up, because I, my time is fungible. You know, it, it, it expands uh, to fill the need. Mm -hmm. I, I, we, I think we hear your heart, and I really appreciate where you're coming from. Oh, you got the, the, the claps. We got the woke going. snaps. The right? woke snaps. That's you know, good. We like that. Yeah, we like that. And, you know, I mean, it's really sad because I can't really make any noise with snapping my fingers. 
Oh, you have that problem too, <laughs> for a different reason. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I want to do a quick segment on the show. Yeah. Uh, this segment is called Pop Quiz Hot Shot. <laughs> I'm already a hot shot. You don't have to show me. No, I know, I know, I know. But did you ever see that movie Speed? No. That's, it's a Speed reference. <laughs> Pop Quiz Hot Shot. That's my right. Speed. Uh, I'm going to ask you four questions. Now, these are multiple choice questions. They are not intended to be difficult questions. The answers are A, B, A, A. Uh, it's a multiple <laughs> choice question. Uh, and it's just sort of like to, to touch base. And we got a pretty good view of who you are and where your heart's at. And we like you very much. <laughs> we're glad that you're going to have your seat again. You're coming. <laughs> some people want it. Some people want it. <laughs> well, fuck them. They should run. <laughs> um, That's what I said. <laughs> really, without the upward. Oh, <laughs> trust me for that upward. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Pop quiz, hot shot. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, question number one. What is the job of the public servant? Is it A, to serve the public? <laughs> or is it B, to build personal wealth? Or is it C, to get us all fucking killed? <laughs> well, fortunately, we can't do C. It's A, of course. Hey, you told me correct. it was A. It was you know, A. But it's amazing how many people think it's B. Yes. Uh, there is almost no way to take any profit from being a, 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 on the city council. Yeah. <laughs> and they pay us $1,000 a month. So, um, <laughs> you know, so the thing is that that if you're going to really do a good job on the city council, you must have already built your personal wealth. Perfect. 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 Wonderful. I knew you did. Uh, now, question two. I don't know if you saw my interview with the mayor. I saw a little of it. He is a big Star Wars fan, and I love to fucking hate him for it. So, question two. Uh, what is the dumbest thing about Star Wars? Um, is it A? Han Solo understands Wookiee language, but apparently refuses to speak it himself. <laughs> is, it, uh, is it B? The central conflict of the franchise is essentially a question of which big thing to blow up. <laughs> or is it C? Jedi swords don't have a stun setting. Or is it D? All of the above, because Star Wars is a stupid show for babies. <laughs> I, I know it's D, and, and, and I, don't know, I don't know which comment to make, right? Because, yeah. because uh, first of all, uh, I was 13 years old uh, when Star Trek, which was the other right answer. Superior franchise. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, came out, you know. And um, so I spent uh, three years in love with Mr. Spock. Very uh, nice. Uh, and made love with Mark Frost. Yeah, yeah, I can even do that. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> it still works. It works great. Yeah. The only thing, the other thing is that I think that only one actual, because uh, I've been a science fiction fan for longer than before Star Trek, right? Um, but <laughs> I love you. <laughs> so the other thing is, is that um, there's really only been one science fiction movie ever made. <laughs> And it's called Blade Runner. Oh. And if you have never seen that, it's it's a film noir. As well. Yes. Yes. It's like if Star Trek went wrong, that would be our answer of the world. It's like if Star Wars on yeah. Earth looks like Blade Runner. <laughs> yeah, right. And that's I mean, except for the rain, I think that's more him. Yeah. Except so. for the rain. <laughs> I love that film. Um, I agree with you, actually. And it, that yeah. is also a better franchise than Star Wars. Yeah. And there's Except like two it's movies. Not a, not a franchise much. much no, there's much two of them, and they're both good, which yeah. is almost as many as Star Wars has. <laughs> <laughs> Out of their franchise, basically two movies. Yeah. Uh, great. Perfect answer. Uh, question three. Hot shot. Um, what is the best way to help the homeless folks in our community? Is it A? enact legislation and partner with local charities and surrounding communities to provide resources based on the actual needs of that community at a scale that legitimately impacts them? <laughs> or is it B, have the police take their blankets and then at gunpoint politely ask them to stop existing? Well, it's A. It's A, I, motherfuckers! I have something else you know, to say about that. Because, Please. Because I actually believe that the legislation and the funding needs to be done at the federal level. It's sort of like gun legislation. You know, homes people can cross boundaries and they're pretty stinking good at it. Sure. But if you expect Boulder County to fund 
Colorado's homelessness, you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. So, you know, a municipality, a, a population center, needs to have the means to um, give a basic level of care to its own homeless so that we do not cause migrations. You know, I, I talked to a homeless guy that lives here, well, a near homeless guy. You know, he's, he's a member of the precariat. Yeah. And, um, well, I think there's a bigger number in that group than people <laughs> might realize. People almost about to be homeless. Yeah, almost yep. about to be homeless, and that's where he is. And he was homeless for a while, and he was in Southern California when he was homeless. And he, you know, he worries at me. I try to help him, but, you know, I, you can't help everybody person by person. Spend a lot of time on it, and sometimes it works. Um, but anyway, he's told me, you know, if I have to move out of my mobile home, I'm going to have to go back to Southern California because I'm not going to spend a winter here. I wouldn't survive it. That's why it's a real issue we're talking about on this show. I appreciate yeah. your candor. I think what we're discovering through these interviews is that it is a problem that Longmont needs to deal with with our homeless community, but it's something we have to work with our surrounding communities mm -hmm. and make the, sure that we're all doing something. That's Because right. nobody, if, if it's one person start, if one community has more resources, it's going to shunt all the people to that community instead of spreading out the resources throughout the county. Yes, yeah, that's, that's actually right. And, you know, the county is just too small, right? So it was, I, I think, a lot because of Boulder County to give just a completely unrelated example. Um, that people worked really hard to get this um, state law passed that says that each municipality or county can um, have its own firearms regulations. You know how well that's going to work. That is not going to work. You know, we live we live on the edge of Boulder County, and and we live on the edge of Wyoming. You know, you think that any any regulations that we put on firearms are going to have any meaning? Whatsoever. I'm not you educated know. on that subject to be able to give a good answer. I'll give you, a, well, I was, it was a rhetorical question. I know, but I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> I don't necessarily have an answer to that. Yeah, and, but, but homelessness is, is like that. You know, you yeah. need to get, you need to get any kind of regulation enacted at the highest level of government possible because you're trying to regulate something or someone, because I don't want to, you know, objectify actual human beings, um, that is mobile. Right, and and so you know you need to have a consistent approach to managing it in that in that case in both of those cases. So you know we do our best with with homeless people, and and I think we have a a lot of pretty humane policies, but they are policies that don't come together and form a solution. You know when when one person loses it, then they can have a co-responder team talk to them. Um, you know, so that's, it's, it's a point solution, but it's not a general solution. So, I, and um, I will tell you, I will can completely confess I do not know what the solution is. I know that it does not involve sweeping them out of the city, and it does not involve building fewer houses or apartments. Yeah. I was talking to a politician, we were talking about the homelessness problem, and I said, how do you fix this? And he goes, oh, childhood education. <laughs> like, if only these kids would bring home a straight-A report card, their parents would have homes. Motherfucker. All right. You know, that might help the homelessness problem in 25 years, but it's not going to help the one we have now. Yeah, it help them this week. Now, was that Bagley? <laughs> I would, maybe it was Bagley. Well, was it was Bagley. So, because uh, I wanted to crawl right through the table um, and, and argue with Oh, sure. <laughs> when I was watching you and Brian Katana, There's no, no reason for me to argue with him. He'll be out of office in a few months if I talked him out of everything and into my position on everything. There'd be no point of that. Yeah, he but, couldn't change anything now. But, you know, he and I are, like, almost neighbors. He lives in Prospect, and I live in Quail Ridge because, like, oh. money, you know. But, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but close enough to be neighbors. Um, you know, but, but what he says, he said on your show that if we want to get rid of a lot of Longmont's problems and make housing costs less, we should just let the neighborhood go to hell. 
Well, yeah, I think he was being sarcastic, stuff. but I, that I, is I what he said. I don't know. You did say that. You know. yeah. I mean, I like Ryan personally, but we do disagree on, boy, almost everything. Yeah, me too. That's where I am. I actually do like him. Yeah, because you can't not like him just like we like you. But, like, uh, we disagree with politicians all the time. It's our job to kind of, like, maneuver those things in the community and yeah, not make well. it our real sticking point. Question four, hot shots! <laughs> Uh, here's another question. This is the final question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> average Americans are facing an historic financial crisis because of the virus that shut down so much of our society last year. True. Uh, during that same year, billionaires got even wealthier and now have time and funding for joy rides in outer space. <laughs> While some Americans are paying their bills on credit cards that literally have the phrase chase freedom on it. <laughs> <laughs> How can our nation ever bounce back from this crisis? Is it A, tax the billionaires? Yes. There were no other options. I want you to know that even though I am not a billionaire, not even close, um, that I voted for every opportunity to tax myself in every election that I've ever voted for. Because, because if you got lucky and got the, um, a, you know, the ability to earn more money than you need, then you're not paying enough taxes. That's right, and most wealth in this country is inherited wealth. So you're yeah. talking about motherfuckers that didn't work for it. Yo, <laughs> daddy and shit worked for that. <laughs> and so like it's it's kind of a nuanced issue, but it's not about like these bootstrap people are just better and smarter than us. <laughs> That's not what it is. You know? Yeah, we have to tax the billionaires. Oh, what was the right answer? Yeah. Oh, so you got a straight that A. Is the, that is the, yeah, well, you told me the answers in advance. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I try to be really transparent about that, which is my uh, my third campaign priority. I've it's, never it's, taken a test that I didn't cheat on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, I can't, I can't agree with you on that one. Well, kids, here's a note. If you're in school and you're having trouble with school, just realize your main job is to get out of school. <laughs> oh. Just learn enough to be able to teach yourself and you'll be fine. Learn how to learn. That's what my granddaddy told me. Please the teachers and get out of their way. You'll be fine. <laughs> uh, don't worry about college. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I enjoy education and We honor respect. teachers. We honor teachers. Even though you didn't. Well, I don't. It, I don't think it's dishonorable to tell the kids to not worry so much about grades and shit. Nobody. When you try and get a job in some years, nobody gives a goddamn if you got a D in history class. I promise. Yeah. Yeah. Marsha, any last notes for the folks? She's yeah, running I, for office, but like she's gonna win. Well, so. So yeah. We I should mean, throw the party for you now. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here because you know I. I don't have to run a campaign, and, and I'm really relieved about that because yeah. I didn't know what to expect, you sure. know. Uh, but uh, I don't like to think of myself as on the sidelines for this election. I like to think of myself as a wild card because um, there's stuff somebody has to say. Yeah. You know, there's stuff somebody has to say, like, you know, you're wrong about the traffic. Stop trying to keep us from building the housing we need because you're worried about whether you can park in front of your house. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Yep. Because first of all, you've got it wrong. It's not gonna make more traffic. Traffic, it's gonna make less traffic. And second, that space in front of your house doesn't belong to you. So everybody needs to stop looking only at their own little circle of interest and realize that what we have is a really fine city that is on the brink of one of those transitions, you know, between kind of a small agricultural town and a real city. And we've surrounded ourselves with open space. So we have to do an absolutely perfect job of urban design in order to make it a fine little gem of a city that's got, it's like um, San Francisco scaled down or even Denver scaled down. You know, we want to have all the things that they have because our children 
deserve that. And you know, our well-to-do children are gonna get that, right? Because you know, their parents don't work 90 hours a week. They only have one job or one and a half jobs if it's a mom and a dad that, you know, somebody probably works half time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they have time to take their kid into regional team hockey and it doesn't matter if the skating rink is down in, in Superior or Lafayette or wherever it is or up in Fort Collins because they don't have to long commute so they can just drive their kids around all weekend, right? Or, you know, we have a really fine symphony orchestra that's about to lose its venue because the deal was that it, it belongs to the school district and the school district is having a hard time giving them space anymore. Um, and we have a bunch of other, you know, we have a ballet for children that doesn't have a place to perform. And we have, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a chorale, like, you know, uh, uh, arias, you know, recitative, that kind of stuff, right? And they don't have a place to perform. And if kids have to be able to go down to the Denver Center for Performing arts to see stuff like that. Two thirds of our kids are never going to have a chance to see that. They're so going to internalize that. That's not for me. That's, that's part not of someone for me. Else's world. That's right. And so social equity means that we have to build Longmont into a complete town. You know, Northern Colorado is sweet spot. It's a gem. And and we can do that. Yeah. But you have to stop believing.